morning. Good morning. Welcome to our time of worship and praise. We'll begin our service this morning with our first hymn, hymn 648, Dearest Jesus, We Are Here. Spirit. Amen. For all that 
we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love and for the courage to, to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, <coughs> maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our first scripture lesson for today is from the book of Genesis, in chapter 12, beginning with the first verse. This will also be our sermon text for today. The Lord said, Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Herod. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had, who had appeared to him. So, from there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west, and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord, and called on the name of the Lord. The sins, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we join in reading responsibly the words of Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel the Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Our second lesson is from the letter of Paul to the Romans in chapter 4, beginning with the first verse. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, 
He had something to boast about. But not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. <coughs> However, to the one who does not work, but trust God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our Father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls, in, uh, calls into being things that were not. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel for today is in the Gospel of John in chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, or no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's Woo, to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, 
but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated. We continue with our next hymn, hymn 570. God loved the world, so that he gave. tells you in all sincerity 
that the chocolate and the crumbs all over their face does not mean that they have eaten cookies right before supper. Any parent would treat that as a dessert. Dismiss the claim. Where else do we see and hear impossible claims and promises? Well, in our text for today. But for the record, Abraham was not stupid. He was not gullible or naive. In fact, if you read the whole story of Abraham's life in the book of Genesis, you find an extremely intelligent and successful man who had become extremely wealthy. He was the kind of man who was smart enough to do what we all do with unbelievable claims. We dismiss them immediately. Well, with one very notable exception. In Genesis chapter 12, God spoke to Abram and told him three promises that make the fictional Malawi prince and the chocolate-covered child almost seem reasonable. God came to Abram when he was already 75 years old and promised him, I will make you into a great man. Now Abraham had been trying for decades with his wife Sarai to have a child. And now, in his old age, he and his wife would not only have a son, but one day their descendants would be a great nation. The promise seemed almost unbelievable, maybe even silly, until God spoke a second promise, which kind of trumped the first one in its unbelievability. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and Whoever curses you, I will curse. <coughs> what made those promises so unbelievable? Well, again, up to that point in his life, God had not blessed Abraham with the most basic, <coughs> the most important of blessings. He had not given Abraham a son, an heir to carry on his name and his legacy. And in Abraham's world, that one blessing was bigger and more important than anything else. Forget money, land, animals, or servants. It was all about sons. And God had blessed him with exactly zero. And now God comes along and says, I will bless you. Right. How's that going to happen? Then finally, the richest promise of them all, all peoples on earth will be blessed through me. And how exact can one person be a blessing to every family in the world, including the countless who have come before and the countless who would come after? Even people in lands that could never know or imagine. It's all. Un 
unbelievable from top to bottom. And yet, Abraham believed every single word of it. In Genesis 15, where God makes these same unbelievable promises to Abraham, it says, Abraham believed the Lord. Abraham was not stupid. He was not gullible. So why did he believe the totally unbelievable? Well, why do we? Why do we believe that the Son of God took on human flesh and was born of a virgin? Why do we believe that Pouring water over a baby's head does anything for a child except make their hair wet and maybe make them cry. Why do we believe that one day dead bodies will rise up from the earth to live forever? Why do we believe that one man's death on the cross 2,000 years ago can possibly do us any good. Are these promises that God makes to us? Do they not seem totally irrational? Don't they kind of offend human reason and logic? Are they not Totally unbelievable. They are. So, are we then stupid people? No. I know most of you fairly well. And I don't think you're stupid. Are we gullible people to believe these things? I don't get the impression that many, if any of you, have invested in swampland in Florida lately. We are smart, rational people, like Abraham. People who would never respond to an email from the Prince of Malawi or believe a child with a chocolate-covered face. Yet, we believe the unbelievable for the same reason that Abraham did. Because God called us to do it. If it were up to us, up to our brains and human nature, we would never believe such unbelievable things. See, but it's not up to us. God gives us trust in the unbelievable. He has work and is still working in us through the good news of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And with that good news, which he gives to us through word and sacrament, his Holy Spirit gives us faith to believe what we never could or would on our own. That God has taken away all of our sins through His Son, Jesus Christ. That He came, true God, born of a virgin, to set us free from God's wrath. And that He rose again and promised that we too will rise on the last day. He came to open heaven so that we can live there forever. It's too much for any person to believe. But by God's grace, we do. So, what happened to Abraham when he believed God's unbelievable promises? What happens to us when we believe through the faith that God has given? Well, Paul wrote to the Romans, Abraham believed God, and God credited it to him as righteousness. God 
makes his promises of salvation to the entire human race. But only by faith do we take hold of those promises and make them our own. And when we do, God counts us as righteous. Oh, not that we are in our lives, but that's how God counts us, by faith. He declares us to be perfect in His Son, Jesus Christ. And faith receives that gift. When Abraham believed, God's promises took effect in him. When we believe, God's promises take effect in us. Abraham believed and he received all that God said he would. He was blessed with a son in his old age. And his descendants became the great nation of Israel. God's blessings followed him all the way to the grave and beyond. And most importantly, all the people on earth were blessed through Abraham. Because through him, his descendants, God sent his one and only Son into the world, in whom we believe and receive God's promises to us. Abraham believed the unbelievable, and so do we, by the Holy Spirit's power. Abraham's faith made God's promises his own, and so does our faith. And then, even more unbelievable things started to happen in Abraham's life. He was already old and rich, except for his twilight years. And then, in addition to those impossible promises, God gave Abraham some difficult commands to keep. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household. <coughs> Excuse me. And go to the land that I will show you. <coughs> it's kind of tough. To tell an old guy like Abraham to leave the only home he's ever known. To go exactly where? Notice. God didn't even tell him where to go. He just said, leave. What did Abraham do? The faith of God, the faith that God had given him, led him to obey that difficult command. The land to which God <coughs> ends up leading Abraham was the most valuable war-torn terrain on this planet. It was rich and beautiful, as well as the crossroads of three continents. And therefore, it was always fought over, just as it is to this day. But Abraham left the comfort and the safety of his home to settle there in that crossfire. When God told Abraham, this land will be, will belong to your family someday, <laughs> Abraham moved and he settled there. He built an altar in that place and he moved right into the heart of this land and he pitched his tent there. He made it his home. Kind of a crazy thing for him to do. For an old man to settle in a dangerous place and then call it home. And then during and after to, to build an altar there to worship God. To thank God for leading him there. 
None of that makes any sense at all. But Abraham did it. Why? Simply because he had faith. The same faith in God's word that made him righteous also led Abraham to obey God's commands, no matter how inconvenient or scary they might have seemed. Sometimes doing God's will does seem scary. But, you see, faith in God can have that effect on God's people. Our faith in Jesus and God's unbelievable promises makes us look at God through the eyes of faith. And it does more than that. It also leads us to be obedient to God's commands. Even when God would command us to do something that on the surface seems kind of crazy, we do it. That's the effect saving faith has on God's people. It causes us to follow his commands even when they're difficult. Even if they're scary. And sometimes doing God's will is exactly that. It can be kind of scary to follow God when he says, your body belongs to me, not you. So stay morally pure because I say so. It can be scary. Because we realize there will be some people who will make fun of us. People in this world who insist, no, no, my body belongs to me. And I will do whatever I want to do with it. Or it can be frightening. When you're living on a, a tight budget. And yet God says to us, make a joyful, generous, first fruits offering to me. It sounds nuts. Makes no sense. No, I, I need to buy stuff for me first. Then, if I have something left, I'll give it to God. <coughs> it's not easy when God says to us, pray for your enemies. Honor those in authority, even when you don't, or even when you disagree with them. It's the opposite of our instincts. And it can be hard. See, but faith doesn't just believe God's promises and receive His righteousness. No, faith obeys God's commands also. Even when they seem difficult. Do you struggle sometimes to keep God's commands? The ones that tell us to be different, to go against the grain in this world? If you do, and we all do, then what do we need? We don't need somebody to scold us, lay a guilt trip on us. No, we need to grow stronger in our faith. Abraham's story teaches us that faith receives righteousness and then obeys God's commands, even the tough ones. And so when we struggle with the, those commandments, let us strive to nurture our faith, to make our faith grow. Let us use God's powerful word every day in our lives. Let us faithfully receive his holy supper. Let us focus on our Savior, Jesus Christ, because that's how God 
works to strengthen the faith that he gives us. The faith that follows his commands, even the difficult ones. So grow in Christ. In God's gift of faith to believe the unbelievable will grow in you. And by that firm faith, you will be able to hold Christ's righteousness with a firm grip. And by that same faith, you will give God obedience to all his commands. This is God's promise to us. We can believe it. Amen. <coughs> and may he who has begun his good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we join in confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God, one true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and a solid church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Congregation will be seated. We join in the responsive prayer of the church. O Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to free us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love, we are lost. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Guard and guide those who carry a cross. In the name of Christ, face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, <coughs> missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and values as Christians. By your spirit, O oh Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Keep in your care those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, and those victimized by war and injustice. 
Comfort all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Watch over those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. Hear us as we pray in silence.
brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We conclude our worship with him 627 to God be the glory. Thank you. 